One Piece manga chapter 1094 titled Saint J. Garcia Saturn. The cover page features a color spread dedicated to Zoro and most of the members of the Shimotsuki family. The name of this color page is 103 Senses, Soaring Jigoku Dragon. This color page is a promotion for monsters, 103 Mercy's Dragon Damnation. I must say, seeing Zoro and Ryuma on a page sure brings back memories of Thriller Bark when they fought each other. The chapter begins right where we left off in chapter 1093. Vegapunk Atlas issued a command to all the pacifista units to eliminate all the marines on Egghead Island. As we have seen in the earlier chapters, Vegapunk and his satellites are second in the hierarchy order. Upon hearing the new orders given by Vegapunk, Atlas, the Marines begin to realize how bad things are about to get for them all. As every single pacifista affirm the command of Vegapunk Atlas with a shing sound, they begin to target all the Marines around them. The situation appears to look bleak for the Marines. One of the Marines yells out for the others to get away from the pacifista. Many tried to flee, but they were all blasted in one go. As the pacifista continued firing their laser beams, some of them managed to take cover. The destruction by the pacifista is proof of the danger posed by them. One of the marines begins to question if Vegapunk has left the dome. After all, issuing the command to the pacifista requires Vegapunk to be present. And just as the marine had suspected, Vegapunk was up in the air in the Vega Tank 8. Vegapunk tells Atlas to search for Bonnie. Atlas pops her head out of the Vega Tank 8 and begins calling out for Bonnie. Sanji joins Atlas and calls for Bonnie too. Frankie wonders how they are meant to drive straight down. He's concerned that they might just end up falling. <laughs> Vegapunk explained that the tires on both sides of Vega Tank 8 were made of the same sky clouds as the road. It has a peculiar ability to stick to itself so they do not have to worry about falling. Moments later, Sanji immediately yells that he has located Bonnie. Frankie, with a hinting suspicion of doubt, asks if Sanji was for real. Sanji was furious. He was insulted by the fact that Frankie dared to doubt his ability to locate a woman with his lady radar. Vegapunk adds that the lady radar of Sanji's does not sound very scientific, but he is willing to put his faith and believe in it too. Sanji appreciates the faith that Vegapunk has placed in his lady radar. At the same time, he feels that the Vega Tank 8 is too slow for his burning heart. And with that, Sanji immediately dashes forward. The scene shifts to Bonnie, where she is hiding. The Marines are searching for her. One of them questions just where she had gone off to. As Bonnie hears the screams of the Marines being attacked by the pacifista, she thinks to herself that the pacifista are back on their side. A second later, one of the Vice Admirals used a weapon that looks like a seashell to destroy the rubble she was hiding behind. Bonnie quickly dodges the attack. Immediately, Bonnie pulls out a gun as more Marines spotted her. Turning back with amazing flexibility, Bonnie shoots the three Marines with a move called NDE, also known as Near-Death Experience. One of the men touched his forehead and was suddenly met by the feeling of death. He began to freak out and eventually collapsed due to his shock. The other marine was foaming at the mouth as he saw the river Styx. Here's just a bit of mythology for you, Nakama. The river Styx is the main underworld river that the ferryman, Sharon, would take the souls of the dead across to Hades. The underworld in Greek mythology was where the souls of the dead resided, and the river Styx separated the dead in the underworld from the living on the other side. The Vice Admiral questions the Marines on what has gotten into them. For those of you who may not know, Bonnie's NDE is a move that tricks people to think that they have died. But in reality, the shock knocks them out. That is why the Marines that were shot had collapsed and started to see the afterlife. Bonnie continues to make a run for it. Moments later, she stops as she sees a pacifista. There is someone sitting on the shoulder of the pacifista. The person declares that she won't let Bonnie go through. Bonnie is surprised. She wonders how this is possible, especially since Atlas had issued an order for the pacifista to eliminate the Marines. Upon closer look, it is revealed that the person is Vice Admiral Bluegrass. The elderly woman clings onto the back of the pacifista as it charges up a laser beam. 
Seeing that, Bonnie is surprised. Vice Admiral Bluegrass explains to Bonnie that this is the only pacifista unit that hasn't been affected by the new orders. Bluegrass has made the pacifista unit her personal ride thanks to her devil fruit called the Nori Nori no Mi, also known as the Ride Ride Fruit. With her devil fruit, Bluegrass is able to hijack and control anything. Bluegrass then questions Bonnie if defeating her would remove the curse on her subordinates. As the pacifista is about to fully charge its beam, Bonnie is just there, standing. Even after knowing that the pacifista in front of her isn't her father, she could not bring herself to attack it. As the laser beam is fully charged up, Bluegrass demands that Bonnie give her subordinates back their lost years. The pacifista fires the laser beam at Bonnie's direction. But before the laser beam could hit her, the lover boy Sanji comes to her rescue and gets Bonnie out of harm's way. Sanji immediately tells Bonnie that she can't allow herself to freeze up like she did. Bonnie was surprised to see him. Sanji knew that Kuma was her father thanks to the others. But even then, Sanji reminds her that she needs to keep a cool head. After all, these pacifista units are not her dad. Their conversation was cut short as the Vice Admiral with a seashell-like weapon prepares to strike in his Zoan form. It seems like this Vice Admiral ate a Zoan-type devil fruit that allows him to transform into a sea otter. That would explain why he has a weapon that looks like a seashell. The Vice Admiral uses his move named Whack an Otter, but Sanji quickly evades the attack. Right now, Sanji's focus is to get Bonnie and him out of further danger. Vegapunk catches up with Sanji and Bonnie and tells both of them to get inside. It definitely was a right decision on Sanji's part to dash forward to save Bonnie. It is clear that the Vega Tank 8 was not as fast as Sanji's burning heart. Vegapunk tells them to head back. As the pacifista are on their side again to take care of matters down here, staying here any longer serves no purpose. The scene shifts to the Labo phase. Luffy and Kizaru are seen up in the air as their battle continues. Both Luffy and Kizaru are growing exhausted. Kizaru reminds Luffy that he has a job to do. He adds that if they keep playing around, he will be unable to finish the job of eliminating Vegapunk. Luffy replies to Kizaru that it is his plan all along. By playing around like this and exchanging blows, Luffy adds that he is doing his job. <laughs> Seeing that the fight is going nowhere, Kizaru decides to move away at the speed of light. Luffy chases after him, demanding him to get back. Once again, we are reminded by just how strong Luffy has gotten in the past two years. Back in Sabodi, Kizaru would easily make quick work of Luffy and his crew. But now, two years later, Kizaru is catching his breath, trying to fight Luffy and struggles to make quick work of the Yonko. As Kizaru continues moving forward, he begins to feel something odd. Luffy chases after him, noticing something too. Zoro begins to feel uneasy, and Rob Luchi looks like he has seen a ghost. Nani? Jinbei's eyes grew wide open as he began to feel an ominous presence. Nami, Usopp, and Chopper were in a rush and totally oblivious to the ominous presence filling the air. Two of the Vice Admirals recognized this eerie feeling, but was in total disbelief. And then a commanding and sinister voice ordered all pacifista units to cease all action immediately. And just like that, all the pacifista units stopped attacking the marines. Atlas finds it strange that the pacifista units are not trying to protect them anymore. She asks one of the units if they had forgotten their orders. After all, no one else apart from one group has a higher authority clearance than Vegapunks and his satellites. That is the Five Elders. Suddenly, a black magical sigil surrounded by flames and rippled with Conqueror's Haki appeared in the middle of the battlefield. One of the Marines is shocked. It's not every day that you see a magic circle like that in the One Piece world. Vegapunk senses a potential danger. He tells the others in Vega Tank 8 that they must hurry up and that something is coming. As the magic circle continues to form on the ground, one of the craziest Marine broadcasts of all time begins. All Marines on Egghead Island. Be advised, Saint Saturn of the Five Elders is about to make landfall on Egghead. The Marines began to shiver in fear. One of them is shocked that one of the Five Elders is about to land on Egghead Island. This is unprecedented. Prior to this, no one knows when the Five Elders have made foot on the surface. The broadcast continues. Any Marine below the rank of Commodore is hereby ordered to avert their gaze. Anyone that fails to comply would not be forgiven and shall suffer the consequences. 
As we all know, the world government is never fond of revealing secrets to the world. Shortly after, a loud explosion happened. The flames and dark booming energy erupts as the Vega Tank 8 continues on the Sky Road. Atlas asks what that explosion was. Vegapunk is shocked after hearing the announcement. He can't believe that one of the five elders is actually about to land on Egghead Island. Frankie asks who they are and Vegapunk tells him that the five elders are the most powerful authority figures in the world. Frankie is shocked, but Vegapunk tells him that it does not matter. They're getting out of here no matter what. As they continue to travel on the Sky Road, a large demonic being begins to emerge. Sanji looks down and tells everyone that something is coming out of the circle. It's quite fitting to see the number 5 written all around the demonic circle. The detail that Oda gives to represent the five elders is amazing. As the demonic being emerges from the circle, it transforms into a large demonic spider hybrid. And there he is. The warrior god of science and defense has arrived. One of the lowly ranked marines could not help himself but to take a look. He wonders if the elder was some kind of monster. His colleague tells him to keep quiet. After all, they're not meant to see him. And just as he was about to tell his colleague, it was too late. With a mere glare of his eye, he kills the marine by telekinetically exploding his head. And with this, we see a complete reveal of the warrior god of science and defense, Saint J. Garcia Saturn in his awakened Zoan form. Saturn almost could not remember the last time he had landed on the world's surface. Bonnie trembles in fear as she looks at Saturn. Sanji's attention was focused on something else. He tells everyone in the Vega Tank 8 to look out as a threat looms above them. A beam of light pierces through and destroys the Sky Road that they were using. With the Sky Road destroyed, Vega Tank 8 begins to fall. It was Kizaru's beam of light and he nearly got them. Moments later, Luffy finally catches up to Kizaru. Ooh. He flexes his bicep and tells Kizaru to hold it. Kizaru is surprised. He wonders why Luffy hasn't reached his limit with his Gear 5 form yet. It's unclear how exactly Kizaru knows Luffy's limit on Gear 5. Could it be from knowing how Luffy's previous forms have a limit? Comment down below and let me know how you think Kizaru knows about the limit of Gear 5. Frankie calls out to Luffy and tells him that they are counting on him. <laughs> Luffy is up to the challenge. He tells Frankie to leave it to him. Kizaru fires a beam of light at Luffy, and Luffy tanks the hit. Luffy rapidly spins around, preparing an attack of his own. Kizaru tried to evade the attack, but it was too quick. <laughs> Luffy unleashes Gum Gum White Star Gun. With an extension of his arm coated with Haki, Luffy slams his fist into Kizaru's head. I think the name is quite literal as stars surround Kizaru. As Kizaru was hit, he knew how bad this was, especially with his superior now on Egghead Island. After Luffy's Gum Gum White Star attack, he's finally at his limit. Saturn looks at Luffy and says, Nika. Kizaru crashes into the building, while Luffy crashes to the ground. Vega Tank was at its limit too, as it broke apart and they all fell out. As if things could not get any worse. They all fell right in front of Saint Saturn. Frankie immediately checks to see if Vegapunk is alright. Sanji is holding Bonnie in his arms. He asks if Atlas is hurt. Atlas tells Sanji that she is fine. Vegapunk looks at Saint Saturn and asks if it is indeed him. Saturn confirmed his own presence and recognized that Vegapunk had managed to cling to life despite their efforts to eliminate him. At that moment, Bonnie remembers something from Kuma's memories. She becomes filled with rage as she remembers a memory where Saint Saturn gave the order to Vegapunk to erase his sense of individuality completely and to make sure that no trace of him remains. And just as she remembers that, she grabs a katana nearby and stabs Saint Saturn in the chest. Saint Saturn is pierced by her fury and the chapter ends. If you enjoyed the video, do give this a thumbs up and if you don't want to miss out on future One Piece chapters like this, definitely subscribe and hit that bell icon. See you in the next chapter, and thank you, Nakama!